14. And then let's also put a finger in Colossians chapter 2, because I believe that one can see here a parallel. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 1. Chapter, Colossians chapter 1. Yeah, Colossians chapter 1. So we're looking at Ephesians. We'll look at Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, and Colossians 1, in particular, verses 22 and 23. I could ask you, what do you think is the sacramental context of Ephesians chapter 1, the whole chapter 1, and what is the sacramental context of Colossians? And you could tell me, what would it be? You could just even just guess, a wild guess. Maybe not so wild. What would be the, the sacramental context? So, the, we were talking about the Eucharist in connection with the... Okay, okay. Um, that's right, I forgot that we talked about that last Sunday. <laughs> there is a Eucharistic context, definitely. Um, um, but before then, of course, it is baptism. It's baptism. Um, now, and, and you're, you know that because you're in the Orthodox Church. Um, it's not hard for you to, to guess that at all. However, um, knowing what you do as Orthodox Christians, um, let's look at... Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, and then Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. And you tell me if you can see baptism in there. Um, and all of this, I believe, is, is giving the, the context, the theological context for the uh, early, the, for this uh, part in Ephesians chapter 1 that's talking about election, election, predestination, and inheritance, uh, which is a major theme, actually, not just in St. Paul, but throughout the whole of Scripture. Um, so let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. Um, I'll read it to you as I see it in the Greek, and I'll be interested to know if the English, how the English picks it up. Um, in him, starting with verse 13, in him, Christ, you, comma, after hearing the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, the gospel of your salvation, um, and after, and, 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 and after believing in him, you were sealed by the, Spirit of the, by the Holy Spirit of the promise, which is the, the pledge, the down payment, uh, uh, you know, the security of your inheritance uh, for the, the cleansing um, of security, which uh, is, it's, it's, um, you have to bring it out, um, for the cleansing uh, that makes you a possession of God. You're now God's property for the praise of his glory. Can you hear the sacrament of baptism there? And how would you... So tell, tell somebody who's not orthodox, point out to them the baptismal sequence here. Yes. What is... So we, because at the baptism we say the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's what, the, yes, chrismation. And that's what uh, consummates the baptism. Um, but did you, did you pick up the sequence, the, uh, the, the time sequence? What's that? There's cleansing, yep, yep. Yes, y yes. Is, does it come out like that in the English? Yeah, so after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, and whom also having believed, then you were sealed and All right. you were redeemed. That's the Orthodox Study Bible? Uh, yes. Okay, so that's the New King James translation. Um, and that's right. So there's a, there's a time sequence here. First, you hear, the word is proclaimed to you, and then hearing, you believe. 
Um, but again, you know, this point that I've been making in sermons and, and elsewhere, simply to believe is not enough. Okay, so, and the reason it's not enough is because um, the, the aim of our salvation is to become one with Christ. Not just to believe that Jesus is God and that he died for my sins. The aim, the aim is for me to become one with Jesus. You know, united with him. And so, um, if I believe that he is the Son of God, if I believe that he died for my sins, and that in him I have forgiveness of sins, the cleansing, um, well, the next step then is to act on that belief. <laughs> By, like what the, uh, the Jews said to St. Peter on the day of Pentecost. Remember, he gives that sermon and, and, and rouses the Jews to belief and to action, and, and, and stricken in, in their conscience, they cry out, what then must we do to be saved? And you remember what St. Peter says. Believe on the Lord. Believe, and, 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 then with, and, be and, and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. The Greek word ace means looking forward to. Ace? I mean the preposition? Yeah, the Greek word. The ace means basically a movement into. Yeah, yeah. So it can have the, the sense of purpose. You know, I don't really know a whole lot of New Testament Greek. I remember that because I was originally baptized in the Church of Christ, and they do believe in baptismal regeneration. But what I'm, what I'm wanting you to understand is that baptism isn't just a, a symbol. It's not just a sign that you, that you believe. It is, the, it is the completion of the belief. Through the baptism, we are physically, concretely, united with Christ in a physical, concrete way. That's how we become one with him in his, the likeness of his death and resurrection. So, it, it, and, and, you know, so um, I've, I've, I've used the analogy before you know, of marriage that to believe in Jesus and to, accept, to receive him as my personal savior, um, sure, that can... Uh, that can uh, create, cause, uh, produce a, an emotional uh, good feeling, and it's probably, it's probably legitimate. It's probably real. Uh, why wouldn't I feel good if I received Jesus as my personal Savior? But it's the same thing as the, as the, uh, as the, girl, for, as the girl receiving the, uh, uh, the, 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 the question from, of marriage from, her, from her, her boyfriend. Will you marry me? And she says, yeah, I'll marry you. Well, she's just received her boyfriend as her personal uh, fiancé. <laughs> but is it done? No. So she wants to spend the rest of her life as his fiancé? She wants to be engaged the rest of her life? Of course not. She wants to consummate that engagement. And uh, that's what the baptism is. It is the consummation of your receiving Jesus as your, uh, as your Lord and God. Um, and St. John Chrysostom, for example, he, you know, he's, he uh, represents the, ortho, the, 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 the Christian tradition, the church's tradition, understanding of baptism as the marriage. He refers to the baptism as the marriage. That's when, that's the bridal chamber. The font is the bridal chamber. So that in the baptism, that's when you are, that's when you are, you, when you become one with Christ in the likeness of his death and resurrection. So um, this then, I, I see as the, as the context, the sacramental context of, of verses 4 through 11 that we've been talking about the last few weeks. This is the context of the election. This is, this is how you become one of the elect. And you could say then that the font, the baptismal font, is the, if you will, the chamber of election. All right? Um, you, you come into the font and you come into the chamber of election. Um, now let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 um, through 23. Um, this might be a little bit difficult to find the baptism, the references to baptism, but um, once you see it, you, you might be able to see it, you know, because um, again, in the setting of the church, um, uh, is it, it, it's fairly easy to see all of these baptismal references. Okay, but now um, he reconciled us in the body of his flesh, in the body of his flesh, 
um, that's an, what's another word for the body of Christ flesh? What's another word for it? The church. The church. So now we, he has he reconciled. Uh, he reconciled. Uh, well, how did I do that? <laughs> And now he's reconciled in the body of his flesh, his church, through, uh, on a, through, through death um, to present you holy and blameless and unaccused. You're no longer accused before him. Um, can you see baptism there? Where, Blake, you're nodding your head yes. Don't nod your head yes unless you know what you're <laughs> doing. So wh what do you see? Um, well, like the whole thing about that you reconciled in his body by his death. Yes. Being in the water yes. Death, yes. 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 It, 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 it's very clear uh, that, he, that, you might, that he, to present you holy and blameless and without a reproach or unaccused before him. Now, um, you know, to present you holy and blameless, uh, does that make you think of any particular part of the baptismal service? Well, he says, our children, I don't know if we do this as adults. We do, yes. Coming, we do. coming into the altar. Yes, they can yes, right the exactly, exactly. Right there. there we are presenting the newly baptized before the Lord. The, the newly baptized by now is robed in the robe of light, the, 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 the robe of Christ, and we're presenting the baptized to the Lord in front of the icons, you know, holy, blameless, and without reproach. But now there, I, I believe that there's much more going on than there that, that I want to bring out, hopefully in the course of this next four, 30 minutes or so. But then I wonder what I want to, what I want to, what I want to, what I want to point out here is uh, verse 23, which I think is uh, augmenting and, and supplementing, if you will, and even a commentary on Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, where St. Paul is talking about election. Um, what does it say? If, in fact, you remain, and in the Greek, this verb for remain, is, is, it's intensified. It's intensified by putting a preposition in front of it. And it means, if you remain in the faith. And the preposition has the sense of, a, of a being on top of, or in the position of on top of, or resting on top of. So if you remain um, by resting on the faith, um, having been having been founded, or you know, been been a um, you know a, a, a foundation having been laid, and remaining steadfast, and not, um, and then the verb here is, is I think is very colorful. It's very descriptive, and not that you might not uh, move away uh, from the hope of the promise that you heard. That was proclaimed and all that has been that is that is proclaimed to every creature under heaven, um, of which I, Paul, am a deacon, a servant. Um, so, if we um, understand the font, the baptismal font, as the place of the election, the place where you become the elect because you enter into the elect, um, well, there's a condition there. You know, just because you're elect, does that mean that you're home free? What now? You have to continue. Have to continue. And then, if we could now, if we go on to say that the font is the uh, is the uh, cor corresponds to the Red Sea, then what does continuing in the faith correspond to? Well, the desert. Yeah, the desert or the Exodus. So, you know, what the, the picture behind here is that now that you've come out of the font, as the Israelites came out of the Red Sea, you're now on an exodus to the Promised Land. And uh, as St. Paul says in, is it Ephesians, where he talks about the pledge that's given, is that Ephesians or Colossians? Um, the, the pledge that's given you, so that you know that you are on the way, that you're on the other side of the Red Sea and not still in Egypt, is that you have, been, you have received the heavenly spirit. And on that point, I would want to say, <laughs> this isn't just an idea either. See if I can remember. Um, you know, this is St. Diodocus of Futiki, um, writing in, I believe, the fourth century. 
Um, we can look at this one. This is, this is typical. Um, he says, um, he, the one who loves, who loves God, and the word that he uses is, a, it, it's the same word, I think it's the word that comes out into English as the aesthetics, aesthetical. So the one who loves God, um, Callistos where in the Philokalia translates it as consciously in his heart. The one who loves God consciously in his heart. And it's probably as good a translation as you're going to find, but uh, consciously, conscious in English, it carries more the sense of this intellectual, um, you know, um, noetic kind of uh, thinking thing. But in the Greek, it also carries the sense of, of sensuality, you know, sensation. So it's not just a thought, and our, not just being aware, it's also feeling it. It's a, it's a palpable sense. Um, the one who loves God consciously or, or you know, in, in a feeling way, um, he, also, uh, he, um, he comes to know, uh, is known by God. Um, for whoever receives the love of God, and again he uses this word, uh, consciously, uh, in, in the consciousness of his soul, um, the, the, the same becomes in the love of God, uh, the, the same comes to be, he comes to exist in the love of God. The point that I'm wanting to draw from St. Diodokos here is that this, this, this pledge, the deposit, you know, the security that is given to us at our baptism of the Holy Spirit, it, it's not just, it, it's not just, it's just an assertion. Um, it, it's, it's an actual experience. And, and I, I enjoy baptizing adults in particular because... Um, they have that experience. I mean, I've seen so many of the adults, you know, when they get baptized, it's like they're caught by surprise. Um, whoa, 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 it's real. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, 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 they're, there's, the, there's the, the joy that they feel. They feel the joy. They feel the joy. Um, you know, so um, it's not just an assertion. It is, uh, it's a reality. So... Yes, very good, excellent, excellent. Didn't Paul T. S. Eliot refer to things as felt thoughts? Okay. So when he was talking about certain poets, yes, yes. Yes. Well, that's that's right on. That's right on. That reminds me of Saint Porphyrius, um, the, the Athenite. He died what ninety four or so. He has this comment that to become a Christian, you have to become a poet. So this word, you know, felt thought, um, to translate this as consciously strikes me as too prosaic. There needs to be a more poetic way of just translating diadokos or pratiki, for example. So if somehow we can make felt thought into a verb, we'd have it. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, the, so the font, then, is the, is the, is the arena of our election. Um, and it's when we become elect. Now... And as St. Paul says in Colossians, if we remain in the faith, if we remain, and, and I think it may be significant, I think we might be able to draw capital out of, out of, the, out of the verb that he uses, where the, where the literal meaning is to remain on, in other words, to rest on the faith. I think that is, uh, is, 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 a, is a, a, a significant way of, of describing it, because it means that it, 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 it sets forth the idea that Really, the only work, the, the work that I need to do, I mean, we, you know, St. Paul says, work out your faith, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. But the work that I need to do is the work of keeping myself resting on the faith. Because finally, I'm not the one who's going to make myself alive. I'm not the one who's going to heal myself. It's the, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who is working in me who is going to put the devil to shame, you know, who's going to raise me to, and who's going to conquer my passions. The, the Christ is going to do that. Um, the only way that the devil gets me to, uh, uh, you know, where I'm getting into my passions, is the only way he can do that is by, is by seduce, seducing me, enticing me to come away. Um, as soon as I come away from the faith, well, it's like I'm fair game. 
So that's the work that I must do. It's the work of, rem or if you will, to go back to Ephesians chapter, uh, the, the verses 4 through 11, where we're talking about the, boundar the boundaries, the borders, which is Christ. My work is to remain in the boundary, to remain in the border that is Christ. That's my work. That's, that's basically all it is. But the reason it's so hard for, to do that work is because what's, at, what's coming into play is my self-love, right? My ego, my, my, which, which manifests itself. <clears throat> In, in many different ways, in, the, in my love for the things of the world, my love for glory, my love for fame, my love for wealth, for food, I love food, um, all of these things. Um, these are what makes, the, that makes it so hard to remain in the boundary of Christ. Um, but I wanted to read this. It's on the back of the bulletin this morning from St. Macarius, and I put it on the back of the bulletin for you guys, you know, because I wanted you to see this in connection with what we're looking at in Ephesians. Let's see here. As in a net. Let's see if they'll make a... All right, well, I'll just read a few. All right, yeah. As in a net, many kinds of fishes are included, and, they cast the, and the, the fishermen cast back the worst kinds at once into the sea. So, listen to this. The net of grace is spread over all. So when we come into the font, we're coming into the net of grace. And even more broadly, uh, what St. Macarius is suggesting is that by virtue of Christ's death, in which he unites himself to, not just to a certain man, Jesus, but he unites himself to all of mankind because what he took to himself was the human nature that all men uh, share, so that the net of grace that was spread at the cross is spread over the whole world. Um, so the net of grace is spread over all. And the translation here is that seeks satisfaction. What does the Lord say? He desires not the death of the sinner, but that he turn from his wickedness and live. Um, so what does it say in St. Timothy? Um, that they may all come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. So what is the will of God? I mean, from Scripture, what is the will of God? Is it that some people be saved so that they, in their being saved, can bear witness to the, uh, the, the unmerited grace of God? That's not what the Scripture says. What God wills, what He desires, is that everyone be saved. So He seeks satisfaction. So why are not all men saved? Well, St. Macarius goes on, and here he's echoing St. John Chrysostom, or it might be the other way around, because I think St. Macarius was living before St. John Chrysostom. But St. John Chrysostom says basically the same thing in one of his sermons. But men will not consent. Therefore, they are thrown back again into the pit of darkness. St. John Chrysostom says, um, so um, why is it that God didn't, didn't show his grace to you? Well, it's not that God didn't show his grace to you. It's because you refused. So it's, 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 it, it, so the, 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 the font is, you know, in the font, God, has, God, is, God is doing the same thing to everybody. Um, he's, he's raising them from death to life. Uh, but now it's upon us. Do you want it? Do we want what we've been given? And how much do I want what I've been given? Um, do I want it badly enough that I'm willing to deny myself now and take up my cross and follow Christ into the wilderness of my soul and face myself? Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to seek my escape, my refuge in Christ and his Holy Mother? Or do I want to seek my refuge and my escape from other, you know, what's going on down here in the TV, in the drugs, you know, in this, in that? You know, where do I want to take, uh, seek my escape, my refuge? So, that's the first point that I wanted to make here with regard to this, to our in our lesson this morning, is that the, the set, the sacramental context for the election and the predestination um, of Christ uh, and the inheritance that he gives to us is the baptismal font. And in the baptismal font, we see that this election is, 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 is universal. You could say it's universal. It's given to anybody who wants it. To as many as received him, to them he gave the power.
to become children of God. As many as received him, to them he gave the, he gave the election. Um, in Colossians, it's also, this, this also strikes me. It's also, this also that I want to say. Uh, verse, again, again, verse 23. If you remain resting, if you, main, if you remain firmly planted in the faith, having been, uh, having been, um, having been grounded, having been grounded, um, well, okay, the foundation. So, what element of the mystery of Christ does that possibly bring to mind? I mean, if you're going to be grounded, what are you going to, you know, what are you grounded in? What is, it, what is it to be grounded? You know, let your mind run free here. Let's do some, some union free association. <laughs> okay, and where did, okay, yes, you're, yeah, okay, keep going. I mean, um, yes, but I mean, you're right, but um, in the mystery of Christ, you know, the, the mystery of Christ's life, um, is there a particular event, let's say, that, 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 that the what? Cross. The cross, the cross, and then what, Graham? After the cross, then what? The, burial the, tomb. the tomb. The tomb. I mean, where is Christ grounded, if you will? <laughs> isn't, it, it, isn't it in the ground, in the tomb? Now, um, drawing another image from Holy Scripture, um, who or what is this Christ that is laid in the tomb. Go back to the parable of the vineyard and its tenants, who, when the son of the king came to collect his fruits, you know, what the vineyard was supposed to produce, remember what they did to him. They killed him. They threw him out of the vineyard. And, you know, and it's at that point that the Lord says, have you not read... The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. In St. Peter, we looked at St. Peter, was it one or two times ago? Chapter 2, he talks about the stone. Let's see, I want to find it so that I can read it just as it is. Uh, 1 Peter, chapter 2. I think it is verses 4 and 5, I want to say. Um... It's not First Peter, it's the Second Peter. He talks about the stone that is, that is, that was, and that's because I'm looking at, say, I'm not look, looking at First Peter. That's why I'm not finding it. Yeah. You find it already? <laughs> um, um, all right. Um, coming to, coming to the living, uh, coming to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the living stone, um, that was that was tossed away by men, um, but that is precious and elect in God, um, so that Christ in the tomb is is presented in Holy Scripture with the image of this precious stone that is the elect stone. This is the stone that the king of all loves. And so, if you are founded, if you are grounded in Christ, in the baptismal font, in his tomb, you see how you're grounding yourself in the election that is not yours, it's Christ's. Christ is the one who is elect. And we become elect to the degree that we choose to rest firmly on the faith that we have received, which is Christ. Okay? Father, the term elect, how is that rendered in Greek? Um, very interesting. Um, it's actually from two words. Um, I'll give them in the Greek. It's this word, lego, which means basically to uh, lay down. like to lay down a stick on the ground. Um, and from that, it, 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 somehow, in its etymology, it comes to mean uh, to choose. 
So it's like you have these things lying on the ground and you choose. Um, and then from there, it comes to mean to say. And the many different ver deri derivatives, you know, uh, ways of saying say, the word to say. Because listen, when you're saying something, when you're speaking, you're laying words down, right? And you're creating a narrative, you're creating a story, you're creating a, a report. You're choosing, too. You're choosing. And you're creating a narrative. Exactly. You're choosing which words you're going to use. And you as a writer know that sometimes that can be a hard process because they're, they're just the right word that you're looking for. And then it's also formed from this preposition, ek, which means out of. So it just intensifies, basically what it seems to do, when this word is by itself in the Greek, it seems mostly to mean this later meaning in its etymology, in its history. And when they, but when they put the, ek, the preposition in front of it, then it seems, you know, just from what I've observed, it would appear that now the preposition throws this word lego back to its earliest meaning of to choose because it means to choose out of, to, choose, to select out of. Matthew? So is, the, is the noun logos etymologically related to Lego? Oh, that's a good question. It sounds like it, doesn't it? I couldn't answer that off the top of my head. Okay. Is there any connection to those toys? Uh, <laughs> no, really, what do you? I, mean, I'm trying to think of I have no really idea. Right? That's true. I have no idea. <laughs> Tim? Yes. The poet yeah. brought up uh, things before you. So poetry is a long history that the poet is inspired. Yes. And in at least Plato's Phaedrus, yes. Plato counts poetry as one of the forms of, the, of madness. Divine yes. Madness. Yes. Divine madness. Yes. Along with prophecy. Yes. Love, and I forgot what the other one is. Um, but uh, the Greek word there is mania, but it doesn't. We associate craziness with madness. Yeah. So something like inspiration. So if you're going to respond to Christ, to the Logos, doesn't there have to be an element of mania, um, inspiration? Because. Um, yeah, I think that's good. I like that. Uh, we don't see Christ like we see our loved ones. Right. It's a lot harder to yeah. access him. Because you see him in the Bible, and, yeah. but he's not like a three-dimensional. Yeah, like right, he's right. A, he's a historical in some sense. Right. Except now he is a three-dimensional person and still is in the church. But you have to be inspired to access that. Yes, and I th you're right. And, and, and on, the other, on the other hand, it, also, it is also a call to you and to me, you know, um, that if... if if I, to the degree that I love Christ, um, I should want to share Christ. I don't mean by, you know, pounding on doors and no. twisting people's elbows and say, you've got to believe in Christ, let me share Christ. I mean, sharing the love of Christ, the joy of Christ. Christ yeah, so it, it behooves you and me, if I, to the degree that we want to do that, to be working on receiving Christ more and more and to be resting myself on the foundation of the faith more and more so that I become more and more an incarnation of Christ. You have to open yourself up. Yes. And that's where the... That's where the will... The <laughs> but also, and also the will. Yeah. I have to choose. I have to want. Christ is not going to force himself on us. I stand at the door and knock. He's not going to force himself on us. But I think that's an excellent point that you're making. Um, and I think, it's, you know, you know in, in the Hebrew, the prophets are mostly writing in poetry. And as you know, the philosophers, they're writing in poetry when the gods and or the goddess re, uh, reveal themselves to the philosophers. They reveal, they, they speak to the philosophers in poetry. What is it? I'm thinking of, uh, what's that? Yes, well, there's different, yeah. There, yeah, there's all these different kinds of poetry in the Greek. And uh, um, so, yeah, yeah, okay, Matthew. 
I mean, I think this is a little bit more apparent in the translations of the Gospel of St. John, uh, the, the poetry, the, the sure. verse in each one. Yes. Um, but I remember when I was reading uh, St. Gregory of Nazan, no, uh, St. Gregory yes. of Nilos, yes, uh-huh. um, I mean, some of that filtered through the English translation, but, right. the, but from the introduction, that was written, I don't remember if it was written by David Delphine or something like this, but he said that in the original Greek, it is very much, I mean, his work is verse. Yes. His work is, 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 a, is a, a poetry of the nature. Yes, 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 yes. And, and, and he finds that in aspects of the created order sure. of nature. Sure, sure. Yeah. In the exact same way that a poet would. Like yes. he, would, he would point to the grass and say, there it goes. Yes. <laughs> it strikes me, too, that the, the passion deadens your responsiveness to things that are full. Of Interesting. Like, if you're enslaved to passion, you are just this passive yeah. robot. You can't. And that's why <laughs> Porfirio says, yes, you can be full. Yeah, you, have, like, you can't be moved by a tree. Yeah. You're not going to be moved by Christ. You're not going to be moved by anything except for and in Christ, you're moved by the tree. <laughs> no, I think that's an excellent point. The poet also, is the word, I, I believe, is also originates the term means to make something, the maker. You're right. You're right. So Poeo. You're, you're not just responding. To yes. Excellent. The word in Greek is poeo. Poetry, poeo. I have not looked to see if poetry comes from poeo. And it says, in the beginning, God made, and the word is poeo, poiein. In the, in the beginning, God created a poet, a poem. Mm -hmm. The world is a poem. Wonderful. Excellent. Now, but, so, let, let, let me now, sh so, um, with this uh, language of, of election, uh, as I suggested last mm -hmm. week, it also brings us, it, it also evokes uh, the prophets, uh, the, the call of the prophet. So, for example, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, uh, people would look these up. I didn't bother to write them out, I don't think. So, um, be easy. so if, if somebody would uh, look up Galatians 1, 15, somebody look up Jeremiah 1, 5, and somebody look up Isaiah 49, 1, And then Romans 1, 2. I can see we're not going to have the time to make, to, to get through all that I wanted to get through, but that's okay. We have next Sunday to continue this. So I might cut to the chase at the end here because there's a specific point that I want to, 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 to uh, bring out this morning. Somebody read Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Who's got it? But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Now, that word separated is taken from the same word that St. Paul is using in Ephesians for orizo, or horizon, or boundary. So separated me out. It's the same word with a different preposition in front of it. So he marked me out. He defined me. He determined. Well, not determined, because that has predestination connotations for us. But it's like he marked me out, and then he set the boundaries for me, and this is what he. So this is what I was created to be, by Saint, by by the, by by God, namely to be an apostle, which is a, which is the next level up from prophet. You understand, because both prophet and apostles are are, are proclaiming the word of God. They're pre presenting the word of God. The prophet is presenting the word of God as a word, as a vision. The apostles are presenting the word of God in the flesh. What we have seen with our eyes, what we have heard with our ears, da 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 da, da. So the apostle is the next step up from the prophet. Okay, who has uh, Jeremiah 1, 5? David? Um, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I con consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. Okay, okay. Again, this before... I knew you in the womb. The point is, in the womb, I knew you. And even before I brought you into the womb, I knew you. Okay, uh, Isaiah 49.1. Uh, okay. Uh, listen to me, O coastlands, and hearken, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, and he named my name. 
Okay. Okay, let's just real quickly uh, look at the, um, at the Christian or the Christological um, uh, meaning of that. He called me from, what does it say, the womb of my mother? The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. From the body, okay. From the body, okay, what do you hear? I mean, think Christologically, think, think uh, New Testament, think Gospel. What do you hear in that? What is that, what, what is that, what is the mystery that that is foreshadowing, prefiguring? Uh, in the Incarnation. Uh, and the body of my mother, what would that be? The church. <laughs> so then what would be the womb there? What is the womb of the church? The font. Exactly, the font. In fact, in, in medieval texts, Latin texts, it's called the uterus ecclesiae. The, 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 the womb of the church. Uh, now, what was the other one? Romans chapter 1, verse 2. Which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Oh, well, I'm, I, that's not exactly what I was saying. <laughs> is that one, two? One, two, is it? Yeah, that's what I have here. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, tr look at one. Look at verses one through two. One, so. Yeah, start, start with verse one. one. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. All right. There we don't find the word womb, but we're look, what I'm pointing out there is, 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 the, is, the, is the call. That was, he's grounding his call in the prophets, if I'm hearing that right. Um, but now, what then is the womb of the church? We already answered that. It's the baptismal font. Um, what, do, what do you receive in the baptismal font, though in a different form, that the prophets also received. This is why the prophetic um, context of, this, of, the, of the election is relevant for us. So let me ask the question another way. Who comes to the prophet? What does the prophet see? What does the prophet re, uh, uh, receive? The Holy, the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is, is, has, is, has a content. The Holy Spirit is giving the prophet something. The Word of God. Yes. The Word of God in the Holy Spirit, okay. What do you receive in the font? You receive the Word of God in the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, um, in the font, in the womb of the church, you are called, you are chosen, and you receive the Word of God, the, the same Word of God that the prophets received, and you could say this now makes us prophets, you know, in, a, some, in some way. I don't know, maybe we could even say this is, makes us apostles in the, sense that, um, you know, in the sense that we are sent out into the world um, in, as the elect. So if we are the elect and we're sent out into the world as the elect, what is the purpose of our being sent out with the word of God? That is in, what is the purpose of it? Remember what the Lord says to the prophets. Um, he says... Um, and, and the Lord says to the prophets that I'm going to do all of these things for this reason, for this purpose. Do you remember what that purpose is? I'm going to deliver Israel from the hands of her enemies. I'm going to bring you to your lands that, so that you will know that I am the Lord God and that I am the one who did this. And in so many other places it says, so that the nations will know that I am the Lord God. I am the deliverer. And we read it last night at the Vespers in the, uh, in the uh, Old Testament uh, from Isaiah. From Isaiah so that they will know that there is no other God, but I alone am the Lord God. So in the prophetic, in that sense, what is the purpose of, your of our election in the womb of the church? To know God and to, make him known. to proclaim him, to make him known. Now, in the church, in the history of the church, we have another word that we use to describe this, uh, you know, uh, proclaiming Christ, making him known, um, uh, it's the word martyrdom. You know that the word martyr in the Greek means to bear witness. So if, I mean, you know, so this, this is the thing. If, so in the font, you were brought into this election and you were called by God and you were made, you were chosen out of the world. In the font, you were chosen out from the world and you became one of the elect. And if you became one of the elect, that means that you became a martyr. You're called to martyrdom. For what purpose? To witness for Christ. Yes. 
What does the Lord desire again? Why does he choose you? Is it so that, that, uh, that, that Joe Schmo over here, who is not chosen, can look at you with envy and say, oh, I wish I was chosen, darn it. But God is so good because, you know, he, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lousy and, you know, no good nobody. And, well, I don't deserve to be saved and you don't either, but he chose you. How good God is. What is the purpose of your martyrdom to Joe Schmo? Well, it's to get Joe Schmo to who, who exactly. What's the will of God? That all should be saved. You know, I have a digital clock. And of course, I'm posted at night, I'm asleep, but in the afternoon, if I'm home and I see 316, guess what I see? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> oh, I, I see the connection. <laughs> Daniel? Yeah, I would add to that. Because God sees all, He knows that you're going to choose Him. It's like Mark is going to talk to that guy, but God, and it may not happen, but God knows, He knows that you're going to choose Him, and He works the whole plan around. He knows, He foreknows, we say, but He does not predetermine. No, He doesn't. But He and just knows. But and because He foreknows, He's working everything to give you every chance that you can to, 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 to live according to his will, which is not that you be damned. He doesn't want you to be damned. But there is a way that he knows that you're going to choose. Well, that's he what it... That okay, that's one reason. One reason I wanted you to read Colossians. That um, you are one of the elect. You are uh, so that you may be presented to God holy and blameless and, and without reproach, unaccused before him. If you remain in the faith, firmly grounded, that means grounded in Christ's death and holding fast to Christ's death and not moving away from it. So now, with that, I'm going to cut to the chase. There's a much of some other things that I wanted to present here, but the, I'm going to cut to the chase. Um, Christ's death is, keeps popping up here. <laughs> um, you know, and so the font is, is the womb of the church, but the womb of the church is the tomb of Christ. When you come into the font, you're coming into the tomb of Christ. Um, you're uniting yourself to Christ in the likeness of his death. So um, how then, you know, I'll, 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 here's the clue. Um, before we come to the baptismal font, what do we have to do? There's another sacrament that we have to do before we can come to the font. Hmm? Confession. Confession. Um, you could say, and, and confession is, I mean, could you, could you, could you say that confession is, is a form of denying yourself? So, if you're going to unite yourself to Christ in the likeness of his death, well, for that, I had Philippians chapter 2, where St. Paul says to the Philippians, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, that even though he was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal to God, nonetheless, he humbled himself and emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant and was obedient to the Father even at the point of death on the cross. So, if I'm coming into the font, coming into the death of Christ, can you see how what, what I'm doing is I'm coming into the humility of Christ, the extreme humility of Christ, so that the path to election and the, the way of, of remaining firm in the election of Christ that I've received is the way of humility, self-denial. The work of losing my life for the sake of Christ, so that all can be saved. That's what I want us. That, that's kind of, you know, that, that's what I want. That's what I want us to see this morning. How the election is not this this reason to trumpet myself to the world that I'm one of the elect, because to be elect means to be called to be a martyr, to bear witness to Christ through being like Christ, which means taking upon myself the mind of Christ, which means taking on the mind of humility, contrition brokenness. Um, we're going to see it in this morning's gospel, in you know, the hemorrhaging woman and daughter, the daughter of Jairus. What we have to offer to God is no, we, we have nothing to offer to God that is our own except our brokenness. 
our sin, our transgressions, you know, the stench of our, of our spiritual corpse. That's all that we can offer, Lord. But that's how we become one of the elect, is by offering that to God, not, not by putting on airs, not by being somebody we're not, but just presenting ourselves as we are to God. And what does he give in exchange? You see it in this morning's gospel. He raises Jairus' daughter to life, and he heals the hemorrhaging woman. That's what he does to us in our confession, in the baptismal font, and in the Holy Eucharist. He saves us. He brings us to life. And makes us, in, makes us heirs of, his, of all his wealth. The story of the prodigal son. So, so, when you come, so coming away from this, this lesson this morning, this is what I ask you to see and to, and to contemplate. That to be elect is to pursue humility, um, self-denial, and the confession of my sins. And trying to be, you know, one with Christ in the likeness of his death. That's how I become one with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Yes, Barb? You were saying that before baptism had a confession. But at the end of the service when the church, they're left as unborn. And then mm -hmm. you said before it's a symbol of how the child, yeah. Proclaim. Uh, well, the mother gave the child to us. You could say the mother gave the child to us dead. Because he's dead in his sins and trespasses. Well, he's dead in the mother's sins and our sins and trespasses. So we, if you will, we put the infant, we didn't put the infant to death in the font, we put the infant's death to death in the font. And now when we put the infant on the, on the steps of the Amvon, now we're giving the infant back to the mother. Now he's alive. This is a child of God we're giving you now. Before he was a child of the flesh, now he's a child of God. You raise him now in the life of the church not in the life of the world. He's a child of God, and you are his mother. You raise him in the way that he should go so that he can remain firm on the faith. Also and where the good news is preached to us. What, what do you mean where the good... Um, the Very interesting. Yes, interesting. Yes, yes. All right, well, we need to get upstairs, so...